Hello. Hey, Elizabeth. Hey. How are you doing? I love, loving the purple blue. You know, <laughs> I hate Zoom, as we all know. And video calls are from the devil. And if we're going to do this thing, I mean, let's at least light it. Let's light it right. I like that. You're not wrong. Well, it's nice to meet you. I don't know if we've ever actually officially met before. My name is Kyle Hutchins. Hello. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. So, Elizabeth, how's the recent past been for you? Like the recent, recent past or like the recent past? I don't well, know. It's, it's an ever-changing <laughs> thing, right? So maybe this week. How did this week go for you? It was fine. Really every week in the pandemic is fine. It's like I stay in my house. I don't see anyone. It's really the same as when I'm not on tour. Yeah basically the same thing just that there's terror and like flying monkeys outside so Very yeah true. that that thing yeah. yeah well definitely a weird time yeah <laughs> so we primarily wanted to focus on the improvisation aspect of what you do artistically but i'm sure other things will creep into the conversation as we go here but I guess I'm curious to know when you first started improvising and how improvisation has, like the role of improvisation has changed over the course of your artistic career. Mm, I mean, I first started improvising when I was a child. Um, pretty much the moment I had access to a piano, I was improvising and like making up stuff. So that's always been just an aspect of how I interact with practice and stuff. Uh, I think when I was in music school, uh, I got bored very quickly with the very limited classical guitar literature. Oh yeah, I'm a I was a classical guitarist, but there's no career outlook in that. So I tell everyone like, please don't encourage students to ever be classical guitar majors. There's, what are they gonna do? <laughs> like, there's no jobs. Unless somebody dies, there's no jobs. Um, so <laughs> it's true. Yeah, you just suck up to the good teacher and then like you might get their job, um, which is horrible and ridiculous. Um, but yeah, so I there's a very limited uh, repertoire for classical guitar. It's just that's it's been it's one of the newer concert instruments if you want to think about acoustic instruments and in that it's really been a concert instrument only for like uh, just over a hundred years. So in order to reestablish a relationship with the instrument, it was necessary to incorporate improvisation within uh, like my life <laughs> of practicing. Um, but then I'm from Florida and Florida has an incredibly large noise community. Uh, we have the International Noise Festival here. So uh, improvisation outside of the confines of what it means in a classical format was always around me. So it really started to impact, I guess, when I was in school and how I would look at improv Im improvising with my instruments and other instruments and then I got into electronics at the same time. I was like going to traditional music school while being in the underground DIY scene. Probably not the two things you think should go together at the same time, but it really, you know, it made me a weird person and people like me for my weirdness. I don't know. Did you ever play electric guitar at all through those studies? I didn't get to play electric guitar like in class. Um, that was kind of like taboo. Um, my teachers were like super straight ahead classical guitarists. Um, my teacher Mark Switzer studied with Pepe. So it's like, <laughs> now, did you just mention a guitar that is amplified? Weird, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> even my classical guitar was never amplified. It was always, uh, 
I used a microphone and I had a Bose L1 Model 2 system. And so that's, it's like, if we need to amp the classical guitar, this is what we're doing because electric classical guitars, <laughs> forbidden. <laughs> So have okay. you played sorry Go i was ahead, gonna Kyle. ask if you've if you've played on that instrument anymore since you've been out of school then so i always say that classical guitar majors never remain classical guitar majors i mean some do the ones that are going to take the people's jobs that are dying those remain classical guitarists but basically every other classical guitarist either doesn't play guitar doesn't play music or plays in weird asymmetrical time signatures that you can't in venues you can't find on google maps there is no in between uh so oh and they're not playing on classical guitar in those weird venues no they're they're on an electric guitar because it's like it's like the constant rebelling against your parents. You're just constantly rebelling against your teachers for the rest of your life. Um, but I don't play guitar publicly anymore. <laughs> it does appear on some studio stuff, but never publicly. So you have played many instruments up to this point, including many electronic instruments and um, just the use of, you know, software in general and, and other noise making devices. So I'm just wondering if, if you think improvisation um, has to do with your ability to just pick up a new instrument and feel comfortable taking it on. Is that part of what you've done historically or? No, I mean, that's probably just cellular memory from some ancestors that might have played those instruments. Uh, and then just, I don't know, I'm like one of those humans that can pick up things and figure out how to work with things in a very small amount of time um so yeah no i have no i have no i have no <laughs> answer for that other than i i just am able to play things i don't know it's the same thing like my i'm pointing you can't see it it's off camera but i have an organ that i got from the goodwill and i like bought that organ never played organ but then was able to play like I'd been playing for years. Uh, I bought an Indian harmonium also off camera. Uh, <laughs> and I like sat there and within 20 minutes, I, it was like I'd been playing it for a long time. Don't know, <laughs> can't explain how, do you, how that works. It's just, it's a thing that happens. So I'm just wondering um, how your collaboration with Nathan Corder started? I know that's more of an improvisational collaboration yeah. or wh however you want to characterize it. You can feel free to correct me, but I know, I think primarily you improvise together, correct? No, no, <laughs> it's an ever evolving collaboration. Okay. Can you talk uh, about that? Yeah. I mean, Nathan is one of like, my dearest friends and collaborators he's kind of like more like a brother than anything else um we met in the most andy warhol way although nathan always says that it's normal i'm like no that wasn't normal that was <laughs> normal at all we met uh at a, at a venue you can't find on google maps in tampa uh it was like a storage unit next to a storage unit where like a death metal band practiced and they were having a digital media art show. And yes, there was a woman in a bubble. So, um, I mean, it was, it, it was Andy Warhol-esque. Like it was, and it's in Tampa. So you wouldn't also expect Tampa to have this weird Andy Warhol situation. Um, and a mutual friend of ours, Eileen, uh, I got there and I didn't really know anyone at the time. And she was like, ooh, you do music, you should meet my friend, Nathan. <laughs> and that's how we met. Um, and then we were involved in the Tampa music scene. Also like, I'm gonna backtrack for a second. So Nathan is from Tampa and I'm from St. Petersburg, but we also have a lot of uh, intersections of musical acquaintances, close friends, <laughs> and musical events that we were either at and never saw each other, never met each other. Uh, Nathan was also a classical guitar major. So we should have met each other 
way before our 20s. But somehow <laughs> we met in our 20s um, and it was, it was very interesting because all of a sudden those connections that we should have had all of a sudden made sense. Um, and so, yeah, that's how we met. And I've always really enjoyed Nathan's view of the world and his work as well too. I mean, he has a piece that involves uh, a, a bag of potato chips and a bottle of Coke. Uh, it's the deliciousness of the moment. And I tell him all the time, I'm like, I will reprise that, I will reprise that piece for you, whatever you want. Like, um, and so, yeah, he wrote a piece for me that's actually the first track on Quadrivium. So um, that was the first piece he wrote for me uh, and it's called Sachet. And then, I don't know what happened after that. Then, then Nathan moved to Oakland and I was very sad because there's nobody here, like there's nobody like Nathan in the world, but <laughs> there's nobody here kind of doing the same, the same sort of compositional stuff with the interesting flair that Nathan has. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's Tampa, it's St. Pete, and unfortunately, a lot of the good people tend to leave. Um, so he went to Oakland, and then uh, Sarah Cahill gave us the opportunity to perform for the Garden of Memory. Uh, I wanna say it was last year, maybe it was the year before. I don't know, time is relative. Um, and so she gave us the space that used to be Pamela Z's space, which has this fountain and so Nate and I were like, hydrophones, obviously, because I built a hydrophone for Nathan years ago. And then I was making a new build of hydrophones. And so we decided to amplify the fountain. What, because, you know, and Pamela came through actually right before the, uh, the whole shebang opened. And Pamela was just like, yes, yes yes, this is what you do in this space. And I was like, yes, we have Pamela's <laughs> knee approval. Uh, and so I played theremin and Nate played guitar for that, uh, along with the fountain that we'd amplified. Um, and it was pretty cool. And then while that was happening, yes, it was while that was happening. Mm hmm yeah keep saying that to yourself no it wasn't while that was happening then I went back, <laughs> I go back and forth to you know the Bay Area uh under the auspices of like practicing with Nathan wherever possible uh so we went it I want to say it was when I went back to perform at the Center for New Music that seems like a timeline that makes sense right yeah okay so <laughs> was that the Center for New Music but I also went and thanks to uh thanks to who who was it that lent us their space i don't know right now like i see the name but i can't say it with my words we went and we <laughs> we practiced uh in space er, uh, in one of the spaces in oakland and we started making the piece that became waking sleeping bodies which there's an absurd amount of documentation of us going through this process because it's a piano piece in which I never touch any of the keys, which is magical and we should do more of that. Um, and I'm like dancing underneath the piano and controlling um, exciters with my uh, MIDI control ring. And yeah, it's, it's a cool, it's a cool piece. And when Nate and I talk about it, it's weird it's weird be for other people to kind of understand because it's not really, it's Nathan is the composer of the piece, but then I'm the choreographer, but the choreography and the, con and the composition are so linked that the composer is like a choreographer and the choreographer is like the composer. Um, so it's a fully collaborative piece. Um, and at some point in time, we probably should like, release footage but I mean Nathan's a collaborator where I don't have to tell him things because it's almost like a psychic link 
and we have the same idea or similar ideas at the same time and it's more just like oh did you i'm confirming that you wanted me to do this thing that i'm pretty sure you want me to do yes okay so and it moves pretty smoothly and also because neither one of us throws a lot of um there isn't like judgment it's a very safe space working together and it's a very exploration zone so it's always been a real joy to work with Nathan um then we had the whole pandemic thing and because of that uh we weren't able to play uh do waking sleepy bodies at a uh, new music gathering this year so we ended up taking uh video and audio from field recordings both of us like to do field recordings um and i also had audio or i also had the video from a plane ride uh from florida to california to go work with nathan at some point in time uh and that also was used in this film and so i did all of the video work and then nate did all of the audio stuff um based on this collaborative drive of material that we had and using uh frame io which is an amazing platform because it's lossless video um and i know i think a lot a lot of the news people and buzzfeed use it but it's a really cool platform not many people talk about it um but it's it's one of the best for video collaboration remote video collaboration and i think that to date <laughs> i'm probably missing something out those are all of the iterations that we've had so it's it's interesting because it's not like we're playing together all the time but it's a lot of collaborative ideas bouncing off of each other and bouncing across the nation which is pretty cool too because there's not many times when we get to be in the same physical location at the same time yeah, so how much of that work, or at least the planning part of it, uh, is uh, improvisational? Like, do you improvise together? How is are any of the pieces structured improvisations? Was that a start? I mean, place it's at any Im point? it's improvisation. Um, we we do improvise together. There's a whole secret s session. <laughs> Not so secret because I've said it now on the internet. There's a whole session of stuff that we did with Moog Guitar um, last year, uh, which will be released at some point in time. Uh, I have to be super secretive about that. Uh, but you're, it's you're not doing Moog a very good job of being secretive. Uh, no, I'm secretive about the timeline of these things, but I can hype the people now. I'm hyping the people now. So I'm when hyped. It drops, you're like, oh my gosh, did you say Moog Guitar? Uh, yeah, there's a Mo guitar and the theremin duo, and you're gonna want that album. So you, you just already know Mo guitar, theremin. <laughs> um, that's all improvisational, and it's a weird type of improvisation because um, I don't know if anyone knows what a Mo guitar is, but it has infinite sustain. Like imagine an Evo just like built into your guitar. Uh, that's basically a Mo guitar. It also has MIDI. Uh, inputs because you know what would be a mo guitar without MIDI inputs and uh the problem with this is that the theremin and the mo guitar sound very much alike especially when you put a mo guitar through a kemper and then <laughs> we have we have you know infinite possibilities of sound also we put an Evo on the Mo guitar, which is probably not advisable. Magnets against magnets does set cool sounding things that probably it shouldn't do. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's improvisational, but in a very different way than any other improvisation because you're like, what, who's making what sound? <laughs> is that part of why you chose that instrumentation? Uh, no, uh, I mean, no, yes and no. Um, we were recording uh, a good friend of mine from uh, production school. I use his studio when I want to just be an artist and not focus on any of the tech stuff. And also because he has so many just 
things to play with. He, he himself was also a classical guitar major. Uh, <laughs> seeing the trend, like nobody's doing classical guitar. Uh, and so <laughs> he has a ton of guitars because uh, one of our former professors basically gave up music and was like, I don't need a studio anymore. I want to buy my stuff. And he used to work for Mattel. So he had Mattel money and would just buy stuff. Like we would, we would actually tell him in class, he'd be like, hey, Mark, this Moog guitar thing came out. He's like, hmm, only, only $900? I'll buy one. And you're just like, okay, well, you know. And that, like putting those seeds in his mind were great because now we all <laughs> we have all that gear. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so the Moog guitar was just one of the guitar options that, uh, that Nate had for that session. Uh, and Nate normally is pretty simplistic in his guitar choices, but uh, the the Mo guitar was a new beast, and it was really interesting to see like the evolution of what Nate did with that over the session. So look out for that. <laughs> Probably gonna drop sometime before the end of the world. That sounds great. I can't wait to hear that. Uh, can you talk about some of the ways that your collaboration with Nate has worked to provide access to kids and disenfranchised community members, which I read on your website is one of yeah. the, the ways that you work together. So um, a lot of me going out because Nate is in school. Um, I go out into a lot of different schools and Nate's work and me working with Nate's work is a really good connection for kids because they're pieces that really shatter the boundaries pretty quickly. I mean, when I pull up the, the piece, uh, Waking and Sleeping Bodies, and they see the video of that, they're like, oh my gosh, but how are, how are you making sound? Like, where's, where's the sound coming from? Is it just coming from your ring? I'm like, no, we secretly hid speakers in the piano. You just don't know about that. We're using the piano as an amplification device. And, <laughs> and so uh, and they're like, oh, and, what, what, but where's the other person? I'm like, he's behind the curtain. He's like the Wizard of Oz, it's the Wizard of Nate. Um, and so to them, it's like, it just like, shatters their ideas of like what can happen. So, um, yeah, I, I use a lot of the stuff that Nate and I create together as a vehicle to uh, engage kids. Um, and a lot of times when I do these sort of things, I have paper and pencils and I normally get the art teachers involved uh, so that the kids can draw or write what it makes them think or feel. Uh, which I guidance counselors have told me that this is their favorite like visit to the school because they get to have the kids access their emotions, which can be a very scary thing because sometimes there's crying children and more crying children than adults to deal with the crying children. But then the guidance counselors like, oh my gosh, it's so great. They're accessing their emotions. No, we don't need them to access their emotions. Let's not have them access their emotions. <laughs> It'd be great if they could just keep them to themselves just for now, just for now, access them later. Um, but yeah, that's, that's, that's basically the iteration of what's been happening. There's some other stuff that uh, we're working on um, to do some more engagement. Now that I'm doing more video work, it's more possible to do, to do those things. Um, but lately that, first iteration is what's been the norm. Does improvisation play a role in that at all? Or can you see incorporating improvisation in your work with the kids in the school? I mean, it's improv anytime I work with children. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Like, <laughs> no, I totally you know, everyone's that. always like, oh, what's your plan? I'm like, I, no, there is no plan. There's, we're gonna go in the room, we're gonna sort of feel it out and be like, okay, this is what's happening today because I feel that if we try to do this thing, bad things are gonna happen. Like it just, uh, and I, side note, I worked as a substitute teacher for about five years. So I really understand like that danger zone. Like before most people know where the danger zone is, I'm like, oh, we're there, we're there, we're here. It's, it's happening. That's so. 
<laughs> I worked as a substitute teacher as well for a while. And that was always an adventure. Because <laughs> every like day all you get... performers, all performers <laughs> should really work as substitute teachers because it really tells you how to read a crowd. Like, <laughs> <laughs> right? Every day is a different group of kids. <laughs> Yes, and I also did a lot of substituting with uh, what diversion and dropout prevention programs. So I've seen things, I've seen a lot of things. <laughs> I've also done a lot of uh, playing new music and stuff for kids in schools. I'm wondering if you have the experience that the people who are presenting you at the school are maybe hesitant about having experimental music there? I always find that the kids love it way more than the adults in the room. Oh, no, no, the adults love it too because I bring that's a theremin. Awesome. That's, that's the key. You bring a theremin, you let everybody try the theremin <laughs> and then everyone is happy. Um, they'll that's let you my come mistake. Back and, yeah, they'll let you come back and do whatever you want as long as you're like, we have a theremin, especially during like pre-pandemic times when they were like, cold and flu season i'm like it's the most sanitary instrument because you play it by not touching it um <laughs> that's fair. i'll leave the saxophone at home next time <laughs> yeah no that's that's a horribly dirty instrument that is like saxophone lung is a thing i've seen mold on reeds it's nasty i don't know i don't know how you guys do that i don't i don't understand it it's and something that's like beyond me I'm like you can't wipe that clean with a disinfectant wipe and you're tasting disinfectant wipe <laughs> My immune system is really good, though, because of it. You know, I, I mean, that's probably an, a thing. But uh, I, my immune system's pretty good, and I play the theremin, so. <laughs> so can you tell me a little bit, like, I before we maybe leave the topic of you and, and Nathan's duo, I'm just wondering how you would describe your improvisation with him or your artistic collaboration with him more if you could describe that more specifically i think of it more as like a two-person collective than a duo um it's we we did a we did a show last august um in florida uh where we did a lot of graphic score stuff that had open improvisation opportunities. I would say that there isn't one set approach to how we choose to improvise, but I would say that I can anticipate what, like the sort of sounds that Nathan is going to make before he makes them which informs my decisions because I also know that he's anticipating what I'm going to do. So because there's like, just like I said, within the collaboration of like working, it's like this unspoken link about how we create together. Um, I think that also carries over into improvisation and, you know, sonic land quite well because you, you're not talking in music. Um, I don't really, like, I, I can't really say that there's, like, specific approaches or anything like that. It's just, uh, we often find, like, one thing. So, um, on that not-so-secret album that's going to drop that everyone needs to, to get, uh, there's the Moog guitar and, like, a, uh, like, one of those spray bottles like the little spray bottles <laughs> and there's a whole like two minutes of spray bottle and mo guitar <laughs> so and that and the whole concept was like we were looking in the studio at the found objects that i brought in it was like oh and i put the uh spray bottle up to the mic i'm pointing at my shotgun mic that's not in the shot <laughs> and i was like and it was like the asmr we're like oh my gosh we need to use that. <laughs> we need to figure out how we can make that longer. <laughs> and so uh, a lot of times it's like finding one sound and trying to figure out how to build off of that one sound for a longer, like a long period of time. Because uh, we also both don't like short pieces. So they end up being long form improvisations. And I think that there's also a lot of space 
um, I know that the Nate tends to do a lot of like sort of iterative, open, uh, what would I call them? It's like a, like if I could explain my stuff, it would be like a single line. And Nate tends to do things where it's like an event and then space and then an event and then space. Uh, that's not always what he does, but that's like one of his favorite modes of expression within the form of improvisation. Yeah, I can see how those would really complement each other. So I'm wondering this, uh, if your structured improvisations, like how much of the music are you trying to control and how much is improvisatory? I'm just curious your, your approach to, to those pieces in terms of freedom for the performer or creating a certain sound world? Uh, it varies, but primarily when I'm composing things that are uh, improvisation, structured or conceptual, I'm more looking at it like a scientist who has a hypothesis and the hypothesis is here and then I give it to the performer to test the hypothesis and sometimes I get the expected response but a lot of times I don't and I really enjoy a lot of times I don't so <laughs> oh, in the case of like uh, your piece meditation for water wind and metal which uh, I guess I've seen for I've watched several times over the last few years uh, is that score, I'm just curious what that score looks like. like is it text-based? Are there actual events that are notated? Like how much freedom it's, is in that piece? It's text-based. Um, but that piece is like a piece that I wrote on tour. And so uh, it, it's a piece I wrote on tour for myself that I didn't actually ever expect other humans to want to do. And I don't know that other humans have done it, but hey, the score is around. And there is an internet. And I know that people aren't always the most honest about when they play their works. Um, but yeah, that piece is, is really for me. And then it was notated for the stupid white supremacist land of applications, <laughs> you know, having to explain something in a medium that doesn't really reflect what it is basically the most white supremacist thing that we've we've created as a system you know to to use that to get money so i'm pretty sure that i notated it only for the fact that i had to do some sort of application at some point in time um but it it wasn't necessarily a piece that was notated i guess you could call it it could have been an improvisation but there was structure within it i was like there were certain gestural events that had to happen like i had to hit the oh no put the put put the glockenspiel bars into the water and then put them on the mic stand and then at a certain point in time i would hit them on the mic stand and then we would like move on to the next event which i'm sure i could go to the score and look at that but uh so that was basically just like these events should happen but it wasn't it was structured but not super super structured if that makes sense I'm wondering actually the same thing for your album, This Is Not a Piano Album, uh, about how much of that is, is composed versus improvised. I think probably the opening track on that serotonin is completely composed, right? <laughs> it's like one <laughs> sheet of paper. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> with, uh, with, with, with some things, but it's not super composed. The most composed thing on that is... Uh, What's that piece? What's the name of it? I don't know. See, I've made too many things and this becomes the problem. Um, it's the one with toy piano and viola. I don't know. Learn your own pieces, Elizabeth. <laughs> but also I'm like, that album was like, what, 2016? Mm -hmm. Yeah, 16. Yeah, that's like four years ago. I can't expect <laughs> to remember things from like four years ago. <laughs> Um, that's like 40 years for me. <laughs> I write so many, it's just like, oh, this is like 40 years, 40 years. Um, but yeah, 
and I should know because it's based on a like the title comes from like a track by the strokes whatever uh, that piece on is, the other is side was that the one yes on the other yeah, side there it. we go uh <laughs> thank you for the phone in from a friend uh, <laughs> Well, I just want to say, I love that album. And when I was playing it, my dog was transfixed by that album. My dog was a huge fan as well. <laughs> How did your dog like Mortimer James takes flight? <laughs> uh, she, I think she slept through that one. <laughs> okay. Because Mortimer James is a real, it's a real object. It's a real, mm. it's real. Um, it's a symbol monkey. And he took flight off of my harmonium when he fell. Hence the name. <laughs> Takes flight. I love that. It was much better than saying like he was a, a like a lemur or a lemming going over the going over the the cliff. <laughs> so on this album, you have a toy piano, as you just mentioned, the Indian harmonium, which you mm -hmm. said is sitting right beside you. I love that on this yeah. album, as well as like theremin and electronics. Can you talk a little bit about your electronic setup and what? You know, it, was it pre-recorded electronics? Were they live process electronics? How were you using those within this? And if it wasn't composed and you're improvising, I'm especially curious to know how that worked. That was, that album is pretty much all improvisation except for those two pieces that we talked about. Um, I just improvise as a practice, especially back then. Um, and also because I, have such extensive experience with Pro Tools and recording. I feel very at home. Uh, obviously, this is my studio. Um, and it's very easy. I, it's very easy to set things up uh, for me to record. Um, back then, my studio was configured differently. And it was configured in such a way that my electronics were always going into Pro Tools so that I could always just turn on Pro Tools whenever and be like, oh, and we're recording in 48K 32-bit float because I don't believe in 44.116. It's gross and nobody should, nobody should tolerate that. It's wrong. Anyways, um, so a lot of it is listening back to stuff and saying, okay, I need to overdub some things. So uh, generally, I would say uh, there's two to three overdubs happening. And by overdubs, it's normally like different configurations of the same rig and improvising it over myself. Uh, that, that's just because uh, I used to have a project, very scandalous. You're getting all of the secret information. Um, <laughs> I used to do what I like to call experimental electropop. It's called suitcases of sound. Yes, because I always had suitcases full of instruments. So suitcases of sound. Took a lot of years to be able to travel with a suitcase without people being like, oh, what is it of sound? I'm like, no, it's the clothes. Um, so yeah, so I, I did a lot of live looping when I first started doing electronic music because I came to electronic music through the vehicle of having a band, an all-girl band in high school, and people would text their boyfriends and not practice. So I replaced them with robots. So that's how I came to electronic music. I was like, I was writing all the parts anyway, so I could just, I could just be in charge of the parts, give it to a robot. And so that sensibility of live looping carries over now into how I look at tracking and recording and stuff like that. So I live looping is obviously the scariest of all improvisation because many things can go wrong and when they go wrong, you cannot fix them. So you must commit to them and you must commit to them in a way that makes it feel like the audience, like you meant to do that, um, which is difficult. So because I don't have to loop now, I'm able to sort of take the spirit of live looping into my overdubs. Um, and yeah, I mean, that really, that really is kind of the same format that I use now where I would lay a track 
and then do an overdub. Play a track, do an overdub. Um, because I also don't, I didn't have access and still don't have a lot of consistent access to collaborators. So this is all happening as a soloist. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much it aside from mortimer what were some of the other found objects you used on that album oh <laughs> that's a deep question and it's only a deep question because i i've done so many things since then um mortimer i'm like looking at mortimer he's in the closet uh it's okay he comes out sometimes it gets uh, better <laughs> it gets better <laughs> Um, Mortimer James, probably some bottles. Yeah, and toy piano, but that's not really a found instrument. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that was a pretty straightforward album. And so it didn't really have a lot of the extra objects that normally I would use. But I did use my organelle for that. So I didn't want to say it's like, there's theremin, but fake theremin duos. So like sometimes I will play the organelle with my like left hand and then play the theremin pitch antenna with my right hand while using my head to control the volume. And that probably definitely happened on that album. <laughs> I've done it exactly, I've done it exactly two times live. And there may, there may or may not be a video of that, but I've done it exactly two times in front of humans. Normally I like to keep that shame to myself. <laughs> Why do you love toy piano so much? I don't know that I love toy piano so much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, why do you use it so much then? It's okay, it's okay. The toy pianos are over there, some of them. There, I have nine of them, but you just have to assure them sometimes that it's okay. You have Maybe. nine, but you don't love toy it's piano fine. necessarily. It's fine. It's fine. You have to explain a little bit of that. Uh, you know, it's, it, it's a preoccupation. I enjoy the fact that toy piano is in some ways a diversion while staying in the land of like Western music. Like it subverts Western music because it's not in tune ever. Uh, I've actually had a couple string players. They're like, oh, we should tune. I'm like, no, you're, you're, you're going to not want to do that. <laughs> That's a bad life choice. Um, I like the fact that it's deliciously out of tune. Um, I like the fact that each toy piano is different. That's why I have nine. Um, each one has their own tonal character. Some ring more than others. I have also some toy pianos that were that have murals on them uh, that I didn't do. I have other toy pianos that I've painted. Um, also, I'm sponsored by the Shenhut Toy Piano Company, so it's very easy for me to buy them. They have my, my debit card details on file, and they're in St. Augustine, so it's like I ask for one, and it's FedEx next day here. So it's, it's easy to have a problem. It's easy. Um, it's easy for that problem to build. So yeah, so I have nine toy pianos. Um, I use them not as much as I used to because it became problematic for me. You know, I wrote the world's first most comprehensive toy piano method book and I had a toy piano festival and I was playing toy piano and I became the toy piano lady and that was very much not indicative of who I am. I do many much many other things, but I would walk into rooms of people I didn't know and they're like, oh my gosh, the toy piano lady. And I'm like, nope, 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 we gotta stop this. So uh, toy piano is on the sideline for now. Um, sometimes it appears in things, but I'm trying not to make my whole life about toy piano. Yeah, so in reference to that book, The Toyager, A Toy Piano Method, I'm curious mm -hmm. about the section that uh, that is labeled improvisational tactics. Like what hmm. is, you know, without giving us the whole thing, but it, could you describe like what's in that section of the book? It's basically just sort of like an intro to improvisation. And it was definitely written before my theories and beliefs about free improvisation not existing as a reality. Um, and so 
I mean, I just, like I kind of said before at the beginning is that it, through improvisation, you can rediscover the love of your instrument and interesting things that it does and interesting things that you can do with it. Um, so I wanted to have that because in, in, an, in a method book, because Toyager is in essence everything I wish all method books were. There's like some history. We talk about science. It's very important because some pianists to this day believe that if you leave a sustain pedal down, it will ring forever. And I'm like, nope, gravity stops the string. Um, <laughs> science, it's important. We should have that along. So there's, a, a, you know, science there's also understand the anatomy of the body because if you don't understand your anatomy how can you interact with an object uh, and then there's music theory and then there's improvisation and then there's practice tactics um, and those are all things that I wish were in every method book because that's literally what should be <laughs> in every method book uh, I, I think that you have to have other different things to captivate your interest and understanding of an instrument when you're learning it. And so by making a book that was that comprehensive, it really gave me the, like it, it cemented everything that I wanted. And I found out like some people actually use it for other things than toy piano, which is cool. Do what you do. <laughs> yeah, I'm wondering how applicable the, the improvisational tactics are to other instruments. Like, can you divulge a it's little bit of what you suggest in there? I mean, I don't really recall too, too much because I also didn't pick up <laughs> the book um, uh, recently, but there's sound, like sound uh, cues and tracks to listen to. I should probably at some point in time make new tracks, but there's never enough time. Um, there's visual things, there's tech stuff. The idea of creating a prompt and making sound based off of a prompt, all of those are things that are introduced. Um, but I don't have like specific tactics that I can remember, like what I did or what space I was in when I was writing that book. I just know that those are things that are in there. Also, that was like 2013, 14. Yeah, 14. <laughs> Six worlds, 60 years away. <laughs> if you were to write a section like that again and say it was like applicable to other instruments, <clears throat> excuse me, what would be some of the components that would be in there? I know that's kind of a loaded question, but. If I were to write about improvisation again, I would begin with the fact that improvisation is not free and that we need to like really stop using the term free improvisation. I know that I'm saying this on your podcast that it's about free improvisation but let me break it down for a moment so uh humans like we can't have free improvisation because our mind can only pick from the things that it knows and not just the things that it consciously knows but there's also cellular memory stuff from your ancestors as to why you like certain music and why you make certain decisions when you make those decisions and so Improvisation is really just an understanding of the self and how the brain makes choices. So uh, the thing that I would focus on in improvisation is the thing that I focus on in my improvisation when I'm performing, which is by having something that can subvert my improvisation and cause me to think in a new way. So on tour, I always have one piece of gear that will probably blow up. Or I make a, a new configuration at the beginning of a show that will probably go wrong. And I specifically do this so that when it goes wrong and I'm shocked out of whatever thing I normally would be doing, I have to think on my feet and I also have to think on my feet in front of a bunch of humans. So it means that I don't have the luxury of saying, oh yeah, Elizabeth, this is what you do when this problem goes wrong. It's like, oh, this thing has happened. People are watching me. Make it look like you're doing, know what you're doing. But now I have to, like, I can't use this thing the way I want to use this thing. And this has caused all these other problems over here. So what am I going to do now? So uh, that's my current uh, improvisational sort of take. 
Um, and it's more based on cognitive behavior and what can I do. Um, I did biofeedback when I was a child, which was traumatic and horrible. Um, but a big impact on my life today. So uh, I try to now incorporate things kind of in a biofeedback way to destroy the line uh, and force me to break away from normal things. So that's probably what would be in my book. I would just be like, put a lot of weird stuff. If you have a cat, put the cat in there, make step on the cat accidentally, but not really hard. Um, you know, just anything <laughs> you can do to cause a disruption and, but force yourself to, to stay in that performance mode while you're being distracted by the many things. So is that something you do when you practice as well? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, uh, I always try to say to myself, okay, well, what piece of gear in my studio is like the least reliable right now? Like, what can, what can I throw in here that is going to possibly cause, sometimes it doesn't cause a problem, but a lot of times it does. And uh, I find the joy of sort of de-escalating the bomb. So how could this apply to someone who plays, like, for example, me, I play the saxophone. Like, how could mm -hmm. I incorporate that concept? How would you advise me to do that? I think that... Uh, the first thing would be figuring out what exactly are your norms when you improvise. And you can do that through recording um, and you can, you should, I always tell people they should video record themselves uh, because a lot of these things that I'm talking about with the brain are, can be altered by visual or environmental changes. So, I don't have like a specific like with your saxophone you should do this but i would say like if you play in a specific position very often what would happen if you change that position drastically in a way that might not necessarily be the most anatomically friendly at the first at first uh and what does that do when that change has happened so it can be if for a performer who is a uh, like an acoustic performer, it can be a body change, and a body change will destroy your life <laughs> sometimes. Um, and so it's really just about creating something that's going to cause that neural network to just fire in a weird way, <laughs> um, because it's unused to those uh, pathways. So it could be like a change in venue or something like that too, like practicing in a different space. Cause there's only That's, an extent yeah. to which I would want to change my posture because that can actually cause injury. So I yeah. would be hesitant to do that, but like altering maybe the acoustic space that I'm in with, you know, thinking of ways to not alter the instrument necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, yeah, you wouldn't stay in that position forever. <laughs> you would be in that position. Maybe you're not necessarily actively playing in that position, but you're noticing that when you engage with the instrument, there's a physical change that has happened that has caused you to think about something in a different way. Um, but yeah, and, and, and of course, you know, being a dancer, I'm always like, okay, yeah, no, your body's not supposed to go that way, but <laughs> we're just gonna move this way for one second so that we can analyze, what do you feel in this space? And then, you know, go back to, figuring out how to apply the feeling that you had in this space to this space. Um, speaking of your study of biology and anatomy, I'm curious if you could also talk a little bit about your study of quantum physics and astronomy and geometry and how th what you've learned from those studies or how they have influenced your creative work and improvisational language. So, I think like the end of event of all of those studies, it's not the end, it's where I am now, uh, is that I have a really deep seated hatred for human centered net narrative and how that human centric narrative leads our decisions in 
improvising, creating music, creating art, and the hierarchy of our lives. Um, so for me, you know, I'm going out and I'm doing field studies. And so a lot of people are always like, oh my gosh, you're improvising outside. It's pretty. I'm like, no, I'm actually collaborating with the leaves and the winds and the birds. And they're like, we're, we're having a collaborative moment and I'm honoring their space and their sounds, the sounds of their people. And, and so I am not trying to create something as a human that just happens to be in a space with other beings and objects and entities. I am equal with all of these objects, entities, beings. And so I'm just participating. And so I guess what I'm trying to get at is that those studies were really the pathway to get me to where I am now. And in those studies, you know, I mean, today I would probably reject a lot of the things that I did in the past, but I realized that they were, they were the pathway to where I am today. Um, but I, I firmly, like, I, one of the things that, that drives me nuts is like when people are like, oh, well, we have to have a story. What's the story? What's the story on this piece? I'm like, no, it doesn't need to be a story. Sometimes it's just sound. Like, <laughs> can we just, can we just have sound? That'd be great. Like, just honor the sound and the consequent sounds in whatever space that the sound is happening as an event and be happy with it. That'd be great. But, you know, everyone wants to add stories and push human-centric narrative on everything, and it's really frustrating. It's why I hate program notes. I mean, not all, it's not the whole reason, but I, it's one of the many reasons I hate program notes, is it creates weird power dynamics of like, I am the creator of all things, and so I have said that this is what this piece is, and this piece can only be this thing. No, it's real, it's really inaccessible, and, kind of and douchey. <laughs> I feel the same way about program notes. It, it kind of uh, uh, doesn't let the audience come up with their own interpretation that may be totally different from what you think. Because a lot of people feel like, oh, but the audience won't know if we don't tell them. I'm like, um, I'm pretty sure the audience has brains <clears throat> and ears and thoughts of their own that probably should be honored instead of trying to be like, I don't know, just like a dictator of sound. <laughs> uh, have have you also delved in at all to metaphysics like astrology mm -hmm. or tarot alchemy this kind of stuff and what have you learned from uh, those studies some things also there are things that i do not f's with <laughs> um there are things energy things that we need to just not touch like we know that they're a thing we need to not go down that road because i know some people some things have happened they have some ghost issues. My house is calm, full of happy energy, no dark entities here. Um, but I know some people that did some things, things they shouldn't have been doing, you know, don't open doors that you shouldn't be opening. That's why I say, like, the whole Mars Volta Ouija board is like, a, that's the... That's the answer for that. Like Bedlam and Goliath was almost not an album because, you know, they were messing with a, like a Ouija board from the Middle East and demons come in deleting Pro Tools sessions. Nobody wants that. <laughs> and then they were so obsessed with playing with the Ouija board that one band member had to actually fly to like Iran and bury it in the desert and <laughs> so that the others wouldn't try to dig it up and play with the Ouija board. Wait, what band is this? Uh, it's the Mars Volta. <laughs> I don't know about this, but I'm going to look that up now. They were very obsessed with Ouija boards for like, for that whole album, they were very obsessed with Ouija boards because they didn't want to, they didn't want to hang out with fans and like girls and groupies. They were like, let's go in the band and play with the Ouija board. No, man, that's not what we need to do.
<laughs> okay, so so you don't fucks with the Ouija board. Mm -mm, no. But what what have you studied in in that realm, and 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 has it influenced your work at all? I mean, um, I am very much into energy work and things like that. Um, I am very under like I understand energy, like I feel it and. I don't know how to explain what that experience is for me on stage. Uh, but there's nothing like super actively like, oh my gosh, let's, let's go do that. I mean, I studied Tibetan Buddhism when I was a child. Um, and I've had experience with Reiki and a lot of different stuff. I don't want to get super like into it because I feel that that's also a very personal thing. Um, but I am an empath and I am very sensitive to energy and energy flows. And so, yeah, that has a, I probably rely on that a lot more than I rely on like learned things in improvisation. Like being an empath is like the secret tool because you can read all the people's stuff. <laughs> Uh, so it's like a cheat sheet and I definitely rely on that. Some, sometimes I rely on that much more than I rely on my ear. It's a secret, not a secret anymore. <laughs> We've revealed so many secrets or you so revealed secrets. so many secrets tonight. Thank you for divulging and making this a nice juicy interview for us. Um, so Elizabeth, what are you working on these days? So much. <laughs> um, film and movement stuff and, uh, I need to finish building some hydrophones uh, that I will be throwing into the water around Florida and then bleaching because there's uh, flesh eating bacteria and brain eating amoebas. So, you know, um, and yeah, I'm, I'm working on my next solo album and I'm, I don't know, I'm just, creating a lot of content got I'm lucky to have commissions from people and yeah just keeping ridiculously busy during pandemic times <laughs> so much so that it doesn't necessarily feel like a pandemic um the, i mean no yeah no florida now thanks to ron DeSantis, it doesn't actually look like a pandemic either <laughs> Well, I, I think we've covered a lot, so we don't, I, we're at the about an hour point, so we want to be sensitive to your time, but this was really awesome. Thanks for your time, Elizabeth. Yeah, we really yeah. appreciate that. I hope there was something meaningful somewhere in that discussion. <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, <laughs> great. it's like a window into, into your philosophy and what you've been doing, so I think that's really valuable, especially to those who then go listen to some of your music and watch some of your videos. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Elizabeth. It was great to chat with you. Yeah.